Mark, absolutely a pleasure. I always love to talk to you. Uh, we had many chats about these, like how chefs are important to me, how I chefs change uh, my perspective in this industry. And uh, I, I'm super excited about the, this talk. So we're going to stick with 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, myself and Mark, we're going to have a, um, um, a quick chat about the community and how actually the correlation on the bar side and the chef side and how can we as the industry in hospitality not just bartenders not just chefs impact um, in a positive way in the world out there so mark moriarty look at that guy a formal introduction you see like two beautiful pictures <laughs> i like that it's an action one and a, like a very nice touch one up there Pose. So is that the LinkedIn career. version and then the, the action. So guys, it's a privilege. Uh, Mark Moriarty is our chef in residence for Diageo. Uh, but before he joined this role, which we're very grateful to now, have a, especially me, I think, and all of us, but I, I can definitely talk about myself, that uh, I, I'm super glad that we have this role finally within Diageo can bring huge value and Catalan is very happy about it. So a bit of a quick introduction. There's a lot more prices. There's a lot more things that he achieved in life. But three uh, main things is to the sous chef of a two-star Michelin uh, restaurant called The Greenhouse in Dublin. Yeah. San Pellegrino World Young Chef of the Year 2015. Back when I was young. And, yeah. Well, it was not long ago. <laughs> and uh, Forbes. 30 under 30. So very quickly, the first we're going to talk about Kettle One, our journey, uh, a bit of the Kettle One family, what we stand for, Bob Nollett, 11th generation of the, the Nollett family, Danny Stamze. Then we go for the Kettle One Hive and Better Drinking program, which is something we are super, super proud. Um, and then we're going to talk about purpose, because that's very important to get something done. 50 best, because 50 best bars and 50 best restaurants, we have quite a few things to share. And then through the lens of a chef, Mark is going to give us his perspective on this community part and how impactful can we be. I always start thinking about the importance of a community. And uh, when we started all this journey um, for, for, for a couple of years now, three years now, um, for me, the, the baseline, even before the Kevin sort of sparked the idea or, or put the last piece of the puzzle together in a way, for me, I've always been looking at chefs. And the reason for that is I always, and I said this, no offense to the bartenders, but they are 10, depends on the countries, of course, and conscious of that, but they are 10 years, five years, 15 years, depends on the country ahead of us. And if we follow the history, everything that the chefs do, normally, later, we as bartenders, we do it as well. We talk about Rotavaps and all these, all the bars now, not all, but a lot of them become a bit mainstream with world class and, uh, and, and, in, and in the majority of bars these days, Rotavaps and all other types of equipment that guys like, you know, Ernest Blumenthal was playing with them in the early 2000s, like 2001, 2002. And uh, I don't know if you know any, anyone was playing earlier, Mark, with these tools. Uh, not from a chef's point of view. I know they were based no. science for a long time before that. Yeah. But I know yeah. if you look at things like they're talking about fermentation was a trend and foraging was mm. a trend, but yeah. I, can't, I know we'll get onto it later, but that was happening hundreds yeah. of years ago. And, and yeah. even back in the sure. 60s, 70s, there were chefs doing it in necessity before it was ever considered trendy absolutely so i always say that and this is proof of like for me that we always go in that direction and for me it's very positive because uh, when i looked at for example jose andres uh on here on the third one uh from the left of the screen is was nominated last year for a nobel peace prize i mean how cool is that i, I mean when i joined this industry 20 years ago i would never think that someone would be nominated for, for a price like that. I mean, we're going to serve drinks when I started. That, that was it. You know, there was not much more out there. Uh, so looking at the chefs are getting to this stage already, 
for me is it's 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 amazing because I, I I believe this slide. I mean, I, I'm just sitting here looking at it and I'm going, okay, these guys on top are the I suppose the the best chefs in their country, and below you have the, the bartenders who are probably some of the best in their country. But there's a there's there's been a reason why on top, if you ask people in public who are these guys, they'll probably recognize more of the top line than they will the bottom. And that's not because there's any great difference in creativity or knowledge or skill or product. But what I've noticed is they've turned themselves into a community. If you look at the chefs, they're the figureheads of what we do. They inspire generations and, and people to go into our industry. And they're essentially what you're striving to work for every day so you can be in that community of the best chefs in the world. Yeah. And what they've also done that's different that probably sets them apart and the bartenders could maybe look at is they've branded themselves. So they've got to a point where they've achieved such notoriety through their craft that they actually are known by people across all industries and they have an opinion and a voice that reflects on people from all walks of life, not just people who are interested in food or what they do. Uh, and it's for that reason that they can then have a greater impact on their community. It's essentially because they've branded themselves. They're very good at what they do and they obviously have to back it up with a great restaurant or great product, but no more so than any of the people in the bottom line. They've just managed to, I suppose, manipulate the situation and brand themselves and push themselves that they can use their voice to have far more power than any food or drink can ever provide. Absolutely. And I think the, what you, you are spot on, I agree with you. But, you know, what I think that touched them more in terms of branding, some of them, and correct me if I'm wrong, because actually you work, <clears throat> you work very close to him. It was Massimo Wattura. This is an example. So Massimo Wattura, I don't think at the time he did because of branding, like with the Refectorio, for example, is this trying to help in a genuine, authentic way that they did it. Um, I, 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 I like to believe that they did it from their arts with all the great intentions. And then that attract a lot of attention. And of course, then they used it as a marketing tool oh, to no, brand uh, themselves and take it to the next step. You're hundred percent right. I mean, they're like, you look at Massimo and I did the Reftorio product. He, that's completely because he is genuinely a person who cares, but he's also clever enough to realize like there are some chefs in Italy who wouldn't be able to make the Reftorio the amazing project it is across the world because they don't have that name and they haven't been able to put themselves out there like Massimo. So he's, he's smart enough to understand the opportunities that his craft and his personality have presented. And then he has the balls to actually go and use his contacts to make it happen. And it doesn't happen cheaply. And he said he put it together and he's been the driving force and the face behind it. And he's turned it into a global community project that's have had resounding effects. Um, and it's, it's all based around very, very simple food and a very simple project of helping people. But it's using his craft and his hard work to be more than just a chef. Absolutely. And, and I think this is where we have to go. And when I look, uh, going to the talk now, the bartenders, Patrick Motua, Kenny, Travis in South Africa, Carl Dalton in Ireland, um, Daniel Warren in, 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 in England, and Marco Aurelio in Mexico, Enrique Robert, they're all part of world class, the world finalists, and they made amazing projects like that uh, they just like blow our minds and i do think and that's why i put together of course as mark said they are we still not quite there we still a few years apart but that's the way for it and this is this presentation about community because community it is for me the and for kettle one what will sort of get the bartenders to the next stage i do believe with all my art that the consumers, right now I can see some, of course it's a niche, but there'll be more, that they will go contribute to a restaurant, to a bar or whatever, if people are contributing and tell the story or serving a meal or serving a cocktail and they connecting emotionally. And I think that's the way forward. And I think that's a lot of these chefs, they have, uh, uh, that's what they've done really well. This brings me, and this all ties up to 50 best, because all you look at that, those famous chefs, uh, they are in certain way. I mean, Massimo Bottura, I think, is still on top. He dropped one year, but that, that doesn't really matter. Uh, well, for some people, it matters more than the others, but in my perspective, it doesn't. It's like the, the, 
is the way he plays the part is the way that that is is himself is his energy i mean when you look at his instagram when you look at what he does his energy uh, is is genuine his authentic attitude and now taking this to the bars now let's uh, uh, mark comment on on the, the the restaurant side when I travel around and a lot of people, every bar owner wants to be part of the 50 best everywhere. That's the key thing now, like top of mind. Every bar owner I've spoke with and a lot of bartenders, they want to be part of it. And the question is, how do I become? Do I need more equipment? Do I need a, a, a more fancy bar? Do I need a bigger bar? Do I need to be by the beach? Do I need a, a more fancy menu? And, and the truth is not, is you need to find collaborations. And this is what I see across the board on the 50 best is two things. And one I will talk later is they very aligned with their purpose. They know what they are. They know what they stand for and they collaborate. They don't just stuck on their own bubbles on the bar industry. They go and they try to explore different areas with chefs, with architects, with artists, and they bring together their knowledge in different stages, in different seasons, in different menus, in different years. But they do that. That's one thing in common I see in all the 50 best bars. So for me, collaboration, community, it's two things that are super key for you who want to be playing on this very top level. It's exactly the same from the restaurant side as well. I mean, it's the question on everyone's lips is, God, I'd love, how do you get into 50 best? How do you? There's no set way of doing it. But what you do see is the 50 best, doesn't matter where you're on the list and like who cares who's one or 50 and like who judges that? Like it's, it's, it's nonsense anyway. But what they are putting a group together is these inspirational figures in, in food that all chefs aspire to that makes the whole industry globally better because they're striving to be in there. Once you're in there, you're essentially part of a very exclusive club where your value just goes through the roof. You essentially have a voice all of a sudden because you're, I don't know, in the top 50 chefs in the world that makes you at the top, top. And what they do is they collaborate and it's a club and they bring it around the world and they use their notoriety and their, um, their achievement to, to make them make events bigger. They, they fly to each other. they, they basically provide events and inspirational events that, that can't be done anywhere else in the world. And on the back of it, when you get into the top, the big dogs, and you're looking at the 11 Madison Parks, you're looking at the Massimo Couture's, the Rene Red Zeppelis. At that point, you're, you're so big and you have so much notoriety even outside of food, like the point before that you can use your voice to be more than just about cooking food or more than just about creating a drink or creating a restaurant. You can start to tell the story of where you're from, the people, the place. I'll give you a few examples afterwards of stuff I've done. And you can basically be in the, in the way you would have like poets and writers describe places or filmmakers make films. You're telling stories and, and telling the stories of people and places through food. And that for me is the 50 best level. And you have to do more than just produce plates of food to get there. You have to be able to give people a sense of yourself, your, your place and the people that produce your food. Um, as well as just making something that's delicious. Absolutely, Mark. So, and for, for that to all happen, for me, that's the key before all these is, and, and this is not a coach training, but, but it's you need to understand your purpose. Not just your purpose as an individual, which is very important, you should figure that out, but your purpose as a business too. And I always say today, everyone gets very overwhelmed with everything. You know, it's like so we get bombarded with uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitch, all these sorts of informations, uh, plus, well, the internet in general, basically. And it's more, I see more and more difficulty of people to decide uh, what they are as a business and not just follow the other people and to just keep changing directions. Uh, rather than just stay true to themselves and go for it. Uh, so I would say, find your purpose as an individual, find your purpose as a business and go for it. People will eventually criticize. Most times if it's quite new and if you uh, ahead of your time, people will criticize. If you're quite disruptive, people will criticize. But the only way you can make these works 
is if you are totally aligned with yourself and your business. And then all these comments, they're not stressful. They're just whatever. You go in a direction and you know where to go. And you're not following the, other, the others. And I think that's extremely important, in, in especially the, the, these days, to be original. The days of copy-paste bars are long gone. Uh, they've done that for many years with speakeasies, with tiki bars, and and it, there's nothing wrong with the whole concept. But you need to give your your own tweak, your own energy, your own vision, and, and that's very important. How do you see this from um, chef's point of view, Mark? Yeah, uh, you talk about the different styles of bars and the copy and paste. I mean, it's probably times a hundred on the the restaurant side of everyone just copying something and doing a poor version of someone who did something original. Um, you look at purpose without getting too preacher about it. Look, uh, to get up every day, I have to have a purpose. I usually set short-term goals as well as having one long-term goal. And it changes, like things happen. Look at the time we're in now that can change your goals. Um, but it definitely gets you out of bed in the morning. And it, it, like we work long hours. We work 14, 15 hour days. And you don't do that without a purpose. So anyway, that, you know, this is what I see, like, you know, just uh, to start wrapping this part up, it's, is this shift, you know, like sometimes from all these global, overwhelming, what to do, so many things, and just go local, go go back to simple stuff, do your own twist, develop your own style. You know, chefs back in the day, they used to travel when they were young to Italy and to Spain and whatever to different types of learn different types of cuisine. Eventually, they'll grow, they'll come back to their to their countries and they will develop their own style after you master certain technique things and when you see what's around you then then with these techniques you can create something truly unique something truly new and uh, and, and local and for me we can get cocked up on these like sustainability very complicated carbon footprints and all that stuff or we can act locally and do our part and if we all think that way then we're in a very good spot. Yeah, I think if we're looking at practically how we're going to be better last week than we were this week, and you're working in a bar and you're creating drinks and you might be coming up with a new menu, um, we work very hard when we're training to learn everything, learn all the techniques. And then I don't know who the quote was. I heard it recently. It's like, learn everything and then unlearn it. So take all the technique, but disregard everything it was applied to from other people so that you can yeah. become original. So it might be just looking around you, looking into your own community, it might be local people, local producers, local stories, local folklore, local climate, um, and apply your technique to tell that story. And then all of a sudden you're creating something that's original and you're becoming more than just a bartender who might create a delicious drink. You're actually producing a delicious drink, but it's telling the story of somebody up the road or, or a, yeah. a certain mountain or a certain community project. Um, and you're getting in then to the realm of being more than just that bartender. And again, it, it, it's not trying to fix the world in a day. It could be just picking one thing that yeah. is close to you or personal to you from your local community and telling that story through a drink. And you're already on the road to, uh, to being a bit better. Cool. So very quickly, uh, because you, can get, you guys can do these on your own time. But I want you to check when you have time. Difference Guides. Uh, that's the website right here. You just have, if you don't find it, you just click it like as better is explained here on the right side of the screen. And this is where we are storing basically all these 20 videos is actually 57. We have 20 so far of amazing stories of bartenders that are doing incredible projects globally. So I invite you, please take some time and go watch some videos at your own time. If you are doing something really cool, don't be shy. You go to the other part so you can see this slide where it says submit your project and you click it there. You just put a few pictures on, a couple of lines. If the project is good, we get it. Ketzel and team gets it. Default guide get it. We try to work it out. We contact you and we try to make noise so people know what you're doing. And that's back to making the right noise to the bartenders like we're contributing some people are contributing with amazing stuff and no one knows um, and these you know like we were saying about the chefs before we need to make that noise that marketing that brand that comes after that beautiful genuine uh, intention then we need to put it out there so the world can see 
So this is where you guys can go. The Zive Collective, that's what we called. Please go and have a look at, at these projects. They are truly inspirational. If you're stuck somewhere, these can serve you as inspiration, I guarantee you. Mark, hmm. are you ready? This is your part. Mark is going to tell us a bit of a, a, yeah. a story from uh, his journey in Ireland. Yeah, so look, I, I knew this was coming up. I wanted to do something a little practical, conscious. I'm, I'm speaking to bartenders and creative people here. So just as it was, we're, I'm down here in the west of Ireland. Um, we're on lockdown at the moment. We can't go further than two kilometers away from our house. But I still wanted to do a bit of cooking, connect with a few people and do something in the community because I used to spend a lot of time down here in, in Kerry and I used to work down here, but been so busy in the last few years, I never really get down. And I've lost contact with a few people. So top left, you can see this is the village where, where we're from. Um, beautiful day. Very, very small community. Um, so I decided to go visit an elderly neighbor who's about 500 meters up the road from our house. And he's, I've always connected with him. He's, um, he grows some lovely vegetables and produce, has chickens in his, in his front garden. Um, and he's getting on in age, so he doesn't see that many people. So he actually really appreciates just going up and, and having a chat. Uh, so what I did was I collected a few bits and bobs from his garden. Uh, you can see on the right, there's his dog, Sally. So we got some he had some beautiful rosemary sprigs with flowers, which have just uh, bloomed in season, some bay leaf mint, it was some fennel. Uh, and collected a few of his eggs from his free-range chickens. So very, very basic ingredients. Um, and it's something as simple as that. It's going 500 meters up the road and meeting someone. is, is, is a, you, You've had touch with your community. Um, and then the deal is I do a bit of fishing in my spare time. So whenever I get a bit of fish, I, I throw some mm. over to them. And, and that's that's the deal through food and drink. And then just I've been in the house so doing a bit of cooking on the Kettle One Brunch team. So I used his ingredients to just try and tell the stories on the next one underneath. You see the sourdough bread. So I got a sourdough starter from another neighbor of ours um, up the other end of the road. Um, made a very, very simple loaf. And then just hard boiled some of Eric's, Eric's eggs from the left, from the garden on the left hand side there. And uh, made a mayonnaise with a little bit of curry spice through it. Mm. And just some of his herbs on top. And I found, you'll see there are white flowers. So some three cornered leeks flowers on the walk back from, from his house and his garden. I found these wild flowers which grow. They're just in season at the moment. They have a beautiful sweet garlic flavor. Um, which might take on a Bloody Mary using Kettle One there. Don't give Looks me, uh, amazing. Don't give me too much hassle for that now. I'm not, a, I'm not a bartender. But that's very, very simple plate of food, using ingredients, getting in touch with your community and, and telling the story of, uh, of Eric and his eggs and a couple of his herbs. And then on the right-hand side, just another version, uh, some chorizo, which is from uh, West Cork, which is about an hour south of where we are here. A very uh, artisan producer makes his own chorizo. Made a bit of hummus there, just something tasty and delicious. Uh, some poached eggs from uh, the same chickens in Eric's garden, and then just a fine herb salad. So everything I picked in his garden, I gave it just a quick, uh, quick dressing straight on top there, a few more of our flowers. And I suppose it's just the way we used to cook oh, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, before we yeah. could get everything from all over the world all the time. It was actually easier to come up with seasonal ingredients and seasonal dishes and drinks. Uh, and I've just gone back to that, and I think our current climate has brought us back to the power of community and reconnecting what we have right in front of us and telling that story as opposed to uh, getting stuff from all over the world. Absolutely. This was a, a second story I thought I'd share with you. Um, I suppose it's not as rustic and it's a little bit more high end. So I'll start you on the left hand side, this beautiful, uh, this beautiful photo. So I did a TV program last year, which we filmed in the summer. Um, and basically, it was everything I've described here. I wanted to tell the story of some of the best young chefs up and coming in Ireland um, and showcase what they're doing to a national audience um, in terms of that branding and marketing idea. So this is the very, very north of the country. So the complete opposite end to where I am now. It's a place called Hornhead in Donegal. Uh, the land on top is very, very sparse and not very fertile. It's covered in, um, a, a, it's actually a weed called gorse. So it's um, in, at this time of year in spring, it blooms a beautiful yellow flower, which tastes, um, well, it doesn't taste, it smells almost like coconut. So for me, it smells like sun cream when I was a kid, used to smell like coconut almost. Um, so it has that kind of sense of summer. And the man who owns the land is called Ivan Stewart. So he used to be a rally car driver, believe it or not, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing he could do with the land was set up beehives because um, all these bees were feasting on the yellow gorse flower. And they were making this incredible uh, honeycomb on the top right, which he's packaged and turned into hornhead honey. 
Um, it's beautiful, rich in color. It's mahogany almost. It's got all those tropical fruit flavors and that really coconutty, nutty scent to it. Because obviously what they're feeding off is this yellow flower. So that was the product. On the left was the place. Couldn't get a photo of Ivan. He's quite a, a, a mysterious character, but he was the person. And I wanted to tell that story through a plate of food. So that's where you arrive here, bottom right. So this is our hornhead uh, honey beehive meringue pie. Um, so what it is, is on the base, I made a sable or a shortbread biscuit, which was infused with the honey. Uh, inside the, the beehive cylinder, what you have is um, a gorse flower mousse. And inside that, I uh, hollowed it out a little bit with a scoop and filled it with a caramel made from the vinegar, which is a byproduct of the honey. So we made honey vinegar uh, caramel, essentially. So you've got all these layers of the same flavors. Um, what I did was I made a quick meringue, piped it around on a record player to make it look like a beehive, finished it with a little bit of honey vinegar jelly so that you all really get that sense of the honey and the vinegar, um, and a couple of the actual gorse flowers so it connects to what these bees are feasting off. And then on the, they almost look like, I suppose, bee wings or whatever you'd call them, made a, a, a paper from... Um, honey, lemon, and tea. So just made an infusion, set it, brought it to the bowl with potato starch, spread it on a silicon mat and uh, dehydrated it in the oven. So it goes like crispy, almost citrus tea and honey paper. And what that does is it offers texture, just from a chef's point of view, it does texture to the dish. And it's got very high acidity, which cuts through the sweetness and the richness of all that meringue and, and that mousse. Um, but we've maximized the ingredients. We haven't wasted any of the honey. So from one very simple ingredient, we've We've used everything. We've given it in the form of uh, sweetness, in the form of vinegar, in the, sweet, in the form of a, a textured paper with acidity and tea, very, very common to Ireland. And we've also told the story of this place on the left. Um, and we've told the story of the person who produces this. So all through one bite, there's sustainability in there, there's people, there's place. And I can't do make a film, I can't write a poem, I, I can't really write a story. Well, what I can cook. Bar, yeah, what you as bartenders can do is you can create something that someone can eat or drink that can tell that same story. Um, and that's the power for me of community and the power of collaboration and using our skill and our craft to be able to tell that story. Absolutely, Mark. Love it. Awesome. This, I'm starving now looking at this. Uh, but the, the, the beautiful thing about this is, the, is all in. It's two things that I want you bartenders to pay attention. Is like the, the way he, he talks about his food uh, so I always say the bartenders need to get, get the game up on the vocabulary um, and in techniques like that, that he's saying to you that you can we can get used we can, we can learn these things you know and sometimes some bartenders say well but I don't have access to a top chef to learn I said well you have access to your grandmother your, or your father whatever a lot of these things as Mark was saying before they've been around for a very long time you know the head to tails or root to flower what we call in a bar um, vinegar, shrubs, um, fermentation, so on and so forth, for many reasons, you know, like, you know, a quick story here is like, uh, many years ago, I used to work in Latin America, and uh, I was writing these uh, world-class studios, and my grandmother, which is in her 90s, she's like 96 now, she was asking, well, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? I said, I'm oh, working on these trends for Barton. I said, oh, hey, tell me about it. And she was telling me about it, and... Um, I can see her face just sort of moving and you know, like, you know, what? Well, that's not a trend. It's like, dude, I mean, I, we were doing that for 30, 40 years. You know, that's what we used to do. It's like, so if you reach out to someone a bit older, probably they will know a bunch of these techniques and you can find perfection, but you can gather knowledge. Even if you, if you listen to these and you say, I, but my, you know, I don't have contact with these chefs or I don't have contact with, uh, and even these days, even more with Instagrams, with Facebooks. When I started 20 years ago, it was very complicated. There was one book of, or two books in English of apartments, no one to reach. You had to travel to get a book, whatever. Now you can just say, hey, you know, like you do a live something. It's so many now live uh, sessions and stuff. And um, people, uh, when you ask for help, they normally really help you. So wrapping it is up. Um, what? Final advices or wrap up uh, is for me is like walk slow, look around you. That's where they are. We can go and be recognized. We can, we, we can, our job can see, can be seen as chefs. 
we close, but we need to work on these community collaborations with neighborhoods with connections and get these out there. And we're going to talk that about that in part two, because that way that will reflect not just the, the, the customers, they will still, they will start perceiving us in a different way, not just the guy that makes drinks and entertain people. It's more than that. We do a lot more than that these days. So it is a great opportunity. So get out there, follow your passion and make your small contribution. It's 7 billion people in the world. We are millions of bartenders and chefs. If we all do our part, we can outnumber the problems. Mark, final thoughts. Yeah, you said it. Find like-minded bartenders, collaborate. You're, you're better as a collective than you are as individuals to, to make great strides. And then for me, if I'm coming into your bar and I'm sitting down from chefs, I want something delicious. It's like, it's do simple things well consistently from a product point of view, and then just make it personal in some way. Everyone can copy and paste. If you just make it personal, you'll be remembered and you'll make progress far, far quicker than without. Thank you, Mark. That was amazing. Guys, keep tuned. Part number two, we're going to do power of community number two. This part number one for this world-class community week. Thanks for watching and keep doing community collaboration. We'll shake the world. Take care.